The biggest thing that the 7800X3D does is make the 7900X3D look like trash. Which actually should be the opening line for this video, so we'll just... Today we're reviewing AMD's new Ryzen 7 7800X3D CPU. This is an 8-core, 16-thread CPU. It's $450, and it comes with the AMD's 3DV cache. But it's a single CCD. That's the core part in all of the specs because... Oh, it's the core part. That wasn't intentional. It's the main part of importance, though, for this, because the 7950X3D and the 7900X3D both had a core parking conundrum where you effectively turn off half the cores in order to play games, and it works okay, but this doesn't need to do that. So the closest competition here is going to be the 13700K, the 5800X3D from AMD previously. That's still a fierce fighter right now. And we're going to be looking at both of those along with the other over a dozen CPUs on our chart. And we're excited for this review specifically because we're adding a lot of depth in this. So we always collect frame time data. That's how we build our frame rate charts. But this time, we're going to present a couple more frame time charts to give you a more empirical look at the gaming experience frame to frame between the 7800X3D and uh, the 13700K. And the boxes on the floor didn't have CPUs in them, just so we're clear on that. But let's get started. This video is brought to you by us and our brand new Project and Solder mat on store.gamersnexus.net. We just launched this mat and the reception has been amazing. Our new mat is made of an extremely high heat resistant silicone and is perfect for everything from hobbyist projects like Gundam building up to soldering components. And it can take direct exposure to soldering irons, flux, tinning materials, heat guns all without issue. Our mat has carefully placed larger sized screw sorters and small part organizers with the left side outfitted with larger part trays for phone screens and heat sinks. Screwdriver holders dot the mat in different places and depths, making it easy to organize paintbrushes, drivers, tweezers, and flux. And they're accompanied with spool organizers to make it simple to keep track of everything in one place. Our brand new mats are in stock and shipping now on store.gamersnexus.net and support our in-depth reviews like this one directly. Grab one today. All right, so for the data today, as stated, we're really excited for it because we've added more. We have 1440p charts more than usual. We typically don't include them, but we collect the numbers. And then we also have, in addition to the frame time data, uh, individually broken out for the 13700K comparison, we've brought in some really good showcases of terrible data that is easy to run into with the CPU if you're using a contaminated OS. We'll show that uh, and plenty more like power, efficiency, gaming, and production. So here's the quick overview for the parts. The 7950X3D and the 7900X3D have already launched. They came out about a month before this. We reviewed both of them separately and we explained the CCD issue and the core parking issue in detail in the 7950X3D review. So we'll leave that there for you if you want to learn about it if you don't know. The 7000X3D CPUs stack the vcache on only one ccd so and the composition for ryzen cpu 7000 series right now is going to be a maximum of three chiplets where you have one is the io die it doesn't count just ignore it one is the primary ccd one is the secondary where secondary isn't always there and primary is the one that gets the vcache on the previous x3d cpus you would have to park half of the cores or not use them in gaming because otherwise you end up having to cross the interconnect or the infinity fabric to go from the secondary ccd to the primary ccd if there is a cache hit on that vcache that's stacked the added latency was worse for performance than just restraining all gaming traffic to a single CCD. And that's where the 7800X3D comes in. It resolved the issue by moving to a simpler layout. And the reason for that is because the 7800X3D, when you park the cores, so you're not using that second CCD and potentially hindering performance with latency hits, uh, you're cutting it down to a six core CPU effectively for gaming, whereas this is eight and it's still single CCD. So don't be surprised when the 78X3D outperforms 79, only in scenarios where the frequency is more beneficial will it really uh, be more of a toss up or allow the 79 to claw back some of that loss because AMD has segmented the 7800X3D down in frequency enough so that it doesn't compete too hard with AMD's own high-end CPUs. As for those specs, the 78X3D drops the frequency hard to just five gigahertz as the up to max boost number. That's a big fall from the 7950X3D's 5.7 gigahertz. And we suspect that's to create the segmentation. Now, as with the 7950X3D, it's incredibly easy to screw up the install or testing for the 
7800X 3D. We installed an entirely new OS from this because trying to transition between the X3D CPUs in this generation causes problems. It contaminates the OS. And here's an example of why that happens. As a reminder, this chart is for the 7950X3D and half of the cores are parked. They're doing nothing. And that's during gaming. That's a good thing because its performance tanks from cross CCD vCache hits otherwise. We talked about this in the last one. And here's the 7800X3D version of that chart. This is bad data though. This chart is on the same OS we used for the 7950X3D but with a full manual wipe of the chipset drivers and with installation of new drivers from scratch. Even with all of that careful removal and swapping of the chipset drivers, the OS remained contaminated by AMD's core parking add-ons that are meant for the higher end X3D CPUs. And so half of the cores on the 7800X3D were parked as well. That's bad because of the single CCD stuff we talked about earlier. This would ruin results if the tester doesn't notice it. We installed a new OS, this resolves the problem completely and means that there are no more driver gremlins left behind. So we're all good for our data, but we wanted to show you what it'll look like if you end up upgrading or something like that in the future. Let's look at frequency. Frequency is important to understand on this part because AMD is tweaking the frequency so far down on the 7800X3D, it's possible that it actually underperforms versus a 7700X in scenarios where the vCache isn't helpful. This plot shows a sustained all-core workload. The 7800X3D ran at about 4850 megahertz when averaging all cores. This is significantly lower than we're used to seeing on Zen 4 parts and explains some of the upcoming disparities. Adding the 7700X to the chart, we see an average of 5180 to 5200 megahertz all-core. It's a substantial uplift and that'll benefit it heavily in anything that favors frequency to cache. That's not just single thread either. This is an all thread load. Now we're getting into power testing, which is one of the most interesting aspects for the X3D CPUs because they're very efficient. So for power testing, we have two primary charts. One is power efficiency, one is power consumption and all core workload. For power consumption, we look at the EPS 12 volt rail current draw, and we use that to get an accurate number for the wattage that the CPU is using. For efficiency, what we're looking at is the uh, amount of energy required to complete a known amount of work. So let's look at the first chart. Here we go then. All core 100% power consumption has the 7800X3D at 86 watts when measured directly at the EPS 12 volt cables. It's about the same power consumption as the efficiency tuned non-X R5-7600 and R9-7900, which is great positioning. For perspective, the 7700X pulled 148 watts in the same test. So the 7800X3D has improved in at least this aspect. Compared to the i7-13700K's 280 watts under the same full load, the 7800X3D maintains a significant advantage. It's a 200 watt reduction. It's a lot. This doesn't factor in low load scenarios or mixed load scenarios, but for all core production style workloads like Blender, it's significantly lower power. As for whether it's more efficient for at least this test, that's our next chart. Here's the efficiency chart. The 7800X3D's 18 watt hour result has it more efficient than the 7700X, which needed 29 watt hours to complete the same work. That's a reduction of nearly 40% in watt hour cost or energy consumption. Compared to the 13700K at 38 watt hours, the 7800X3D benefits from a 52% reduction in watt hours and pose significantly advantaged efficiency in an all core full load scenario. Being the most efficient doesn't technically mean that it completes first or anything like that. It just means that it completes a known amount of work with lower overall energy consumption for that same fixed work that's being completed. Now we're getting to the frame time charts. We're experimenting with publishing more of these in our reviews because we, it's the most empirical, purest look at the frame to frame data that you can get. But the problem is frame time charts are not clean. You can't get a lot of bars on them. You can't get a lot of comparisons on them. Once you're past two devices, it gets kind of hard to interpret and read them and the lines obscure each other. So for this, we have just two CPUs, the 13.7 and the 78 X3D. And then we have everything else in the rate charts as usual. But uh, let us know what you think about this because we are adding the extra data. If people don't care, that's fine. You can always get it in the average FPS charts, but this gives you a little bit more info. So uh, first of all, some quick education here. Frame times are simply put uh, the metric that is used to derive the frame rate. You turn the time into a rate. It's pretty simple math. 
But the reason frame times are interesting is because uh, uh, frame rates and averages, even 1% lows and 0.1% lows, which are averages, those start to blur over any massive excursions or minor problems if they're not sufficient to change the average itself in a way that triggers the technician to check that data more closely. Now, normally that's fine because for us, when we see numbers that look out of place, we check more closely, we give you these charts, but now we want to present them uh, more frequently. So what you're going to be looking at is the y-axis is milliseconds required to render or present a frame to the screen and excursions greater than eight milliseconds tend to become noticeable, but primarily if they are frequent in occurrence, whereas excursions that are significant, let's say 150 milliseconds or especially 500 milliseconds, half a second, uh, one of those is noticeable as like a hitch or a stutter. So that's what you're gonna be looking at and these will be just head to head. Let's get started. Here's the CSGO frame time plot at 1080p. The 13700K plots between two to four milliseconds on average, which is ridiculous, with two spikes to around 10 milliseconds and a few other minor spikes. None of these are frequent or large enough to be noticeable uh, you need more frequent 8 millisecond plus deviations or much larger excursions. The frame to frame experience is consistent here. The same goes when we add the 7800X3D to the plot. This runs almost exactly the same intervals, although with marginally wider ranges top to bottom against the average. The spikes are similar in count, and the difference between the peaks is within reasonable run-to-run -run variation on the two CPUs, so they're about the same. With Cyberpunk, the 13700K fluctuated below 8 milliseconds on average. The load is easier for the CPU earlier in the test, with difficulty ramping towards the end. Only two massive spikes appear, and one breaks the chart bounce. The worst of these two lands at 42 milliseconds, which is enough of a swing to be briefly noticeable as a stutter, maybe. Depends on what you're doing in the game. When plotting the 7800X3D, we noticed frequent excursions from the mean. The frame times regularly jumped about four milliseconds over the prior frame, but a four millisecond delta itself isn't particularly bad, and this isn't as bad as micro stutter. But the consistency with which it happens indicates an issue and not just some one-off spike. Despite this, the CPU remains more than playable. The X3D spikes at the same spot as the 13700K did at the end, with the timing lining up on further inspection with a scene change in the game. The X3D spikes to 60 milliseconds here versus 42 on the other, but it happens on both, so this effectively nullifies it in a comparison because it's just it's a game loading scene change. In Far Cry 6, the overall frame-to-frame -frame consistency is excellent on both CPUs. The 13700K is slower in frame rate and hits a snag of several spikes around frame 700. The X3D is technically faster in frame rate, but has its own occasional spikes in frame time. The spikes experienced on both of these CPUs are a normal part of gaming. They aren't anomalous, unplayable, or anything we'd characterize as weird. It's just software, and both are fine, despite their unique behaviors. The X3D is advantaged here over the 13700K. That's something we know about Far Cry with Vcash. So now we're moving to the rate comparison. So average FPS 1% and 0.1% lows. Shadow of the Tomb Raider is up first. This shows greater response for X3D CPUs. The 7800X3D positions itself in second, just behind the freshly retested 7950X3D. At 386 FPS average, the 7800X3D leads the still good 5800X3D by 16% the 13900K by a massive 27%, while being about $100 cheaper, and the 13700K by 36%, although the 7800X3D costs 5 to 14% more than the 13700K, depending on pricing at the time this goes up. That's far better scaling than the 1% FPS for 1% more money scale that we seem to be stuck on for the GPU market. So, at least in CPU land, it's still somewhat sane. The X3D CPUs have established their own cluster at the top of this chart, demonstrating that, as we've said before, it works great when games can make use of it. We run 1440p for this one as well. You can see that the GPU has capped the maximum performance for all CPUs, expectedly, but the X3D chips still punch above everything else on the chart. Testing Counter-Strike GO at 1080p, the R7 7800 X3D landed at 407 FPS average, with lows paced proportionally at 291 and 220 FPS. This is slightly better than the 7950X3D that we just retested, and the lows are significantly better than the preferred frequency test that we ran on the 7950X3D previously. The Direct 13700K competitor manages to outperform AMD's 7800X3D in average FPS marginally, 1.6% here, 
with 1% lows the same and 0.1% lows worthy of further inspection, uh, but we did that in our frame time chart earlier. More importantly, the 7700X outperforms the 7800X 3D here. That was true of the 7950X outperforming the 7950X 3D as well. The extra VCash just isn't helping the 7800X 3D in this title. That's fine. They don't always use every feature. And in this case, CSGO just cares more about the frequency and kind of the cores than it does that extra cache. CSGO at 1440p is functionally the same. It's CPU bound, so the results don't change. We'll breeze past this chart. Final Fantasy XIV Endwalker is next, tested with the built-in benchmark to avoid the huge variable presented by connecting to the network. The 7800X 3D ran at 252 FPS average, with a low spaced, as we'd expect, for AMD CPUs at 137 and 106 FPS average for 1% and 0.1% lows. The 13600K maintains better lows and has a tied average to the 7800X 3D, making the 7800X 3D worse value than Intel's $300 i5 CPU. This 7950X 3D and 7900X 3D offer no meaningful change from the new 7800X 3D. Maybe that's part of why AMD delayed the launch on this one. 1440p is largely the same, we're CPU bound, so that's good to confirm. And playing at 1440p with a 4090 would still benefit from the same CPUs as the 1080p performance we plotted. Far Cry 6 is another game that performs particularly well with 3D vCache. The 7800X 3D is our new chart topper at 224 FPS average, leading the 7950X 3D by 12% and with lows about the same. The lead over the 13900K is similar, with a 20% lead over the directly competing i7 13700K. That's a good showing from AMD's newest part here. The 13600K remains good overall value though at a relatively high end, tying the 5800X 3D in performance. But the 7800X 3D takes away all the high end dominance from all the other parts. Performance at 1440p is about the same with some loss off the very top end of the score. The 7800X 3D maintains its leading position here overall. In Cyberpunk 2077, the 7800X 3D ran at 260 FPS average with the lows at 118 and 79. That has it about equal to the 7900X 3D, which is not good for the 7900X 3D, that is, but it's behind the 13700K in frame time consistency. The averages are the same, but as we saw in our earlier frame time plot, the 13700K maintains an advantage in this specific title. The 7950X 3D pushes slightly higher with its frequency advantage. F1 2022 is next, tested at 1080p high. The 7800X 3D ran at 508 FPS average here, allowing the 7950X 3D a lead of 1%. It's massive, definitely worth hundreds of dollars. The 7800X 3D, that, that was sarcasm before somebody goes and buys it. The 7800X 3D leads the 7900X 3D once again, thanks to its core advantage when gaming. Compared to the 13900K, the 7800X 3D holds an 11% lead in average FPS, with the lows also improved. The 13700K gives up a 17% lead to the 7800X 3D, which again leads in lows, as seen in the frame time plots. This is another scenario where the X3D CPUs actually seem to be doing something, the game can leverage it, but it's a scenario that makes the 7900X 3D look like a total waste in comparison to the new 78X 3D. Kind of makes sense why AMD delayed this one now. In Total War Warhammer 3, the 7800X 3D pushed to 311 FPS average and functionally tied the 13700K competition. That's not great considering the 13700K is cheaper, but it could be enough to hold the line when considering the full picture of other games. We'll talk about that at the end. The 7800X 3D outmatches the 7900X 3D once again, further driving the nail into that coffin for gaming for the 79X 3D. The 13600K remains the fiercest fighter against all these expensive CPUs and still offers some of the best overall high-end value, so it would be worth considering giving up 10 FPS for big savings that can be diverted to GPUs or memory instead. Now we're getting into production testing. This is workstation applications, content creation applications, things like that. This is where the value will start to degrade because historically the additional cache does not benefit these CPUs in the applications we test for production as much as say more cores or frequency would. Blender cycles rendering is first. This uses a tile-based renderer where one tile is spawned per thread. Even with all 16 threads running, the 7800X 3D is heavily disadvantaged here. The 7700X outperforms it, benefiting from the higher frequency more than the cache. The 13600K also embarrasses the 7800X 3D for the price, using its 6P cores and 8E cores, totaling 12 threads with hyper-threading, to land a 10.7 minute render time. 
That's a reduction of 16% against the 7800X 3D. It's not a good start for AMD on production value. It can do it, but you really need to be buying it as a gaming first CPU that can handle this type of work as a secondary. When compiling the Chromium code base, the 7800X 3D required 67 minutes to complete the compile, getting beaten once again by the 64 minute result of the 7700X. The 13600K has a 19% lead, driving the dagger in for AMD's X3D in this type of workload. In file compression benchmarking, ranked in millions of instructions per second, the 7800X3D once again falls behind. It completes 118,000 MIPS here, allowing the 7700X a lead at technically 122,000 MIPS, and the 13600K a lead at 132,000 MIPS. The comparably priced 13700K, meanwhile, is 35% ahead with a 159,000 MIPS score. Decompression has the 7800X3D at 135,000 MIPS, once again positioning the 7700X ahead of it. In this one, it at least ties the 13600K and gets proportionally closer to the 13700K, but the value is still bad. Adobe Premiere is tested in aggregate with the Puget Suite, analyzing scrubbing, playback, render time, warp stabilization, and other effects. The 7800X 3D scored 1,057 points, putting it behind the 5900X, 7700X, 13600K, and 13700K. It's only outperforming the R5 7600X and the 5800X 3D from the recent generations. Photoshop is tested the same way, just with different filters and features. The 7800X 3D ranks relatively high on this chart, but it's still behind the 7700X and 13700K. It manages to outperform at least the 13600K though. Now we're moving into thermals. First of all, thermals can't be compared cross-brand in any meaningful way. So Intel and AMD, the temperature means different things because, for example, Intel has a 70 degree threshold for TVB to activate, AMD has PB2 where scaling is affected all the way up the line, and it boosts to TJ Maxx now. Uh, so you can't compare them cross-brand and really cross-architecture you shouldn't be either because the sensors are in different spots, they mean different things, and they report differently, uh, and it just behaves differently. But as a reminder, Temperature, even when we do compare them within the same architecture, which we're going to do today, isn't some 3D Mark score. It's not like this, this one runs at 70C. That's not how it works. It doesn't mean anything because the cooler, the ambient temperature, the cooler fan speed, uh, the case, all of these things, the, the load, is it AVX or not, all of it impacts the temperature that comes out the other end. All that matters for our testing here is that it is a pure AB comparison and we are doing it for educational purposes to look at how the 78X 3D behaves versus the 7700X. So that's simple. The 7800X 3D with our Liquid Freezer 2 360 attached ran at 75 degrees Celsius. This is relatively low for Zen 4 because as another reminder, Zen 4 typically boosts the clocks until it hits TJ Maxx. In this instance, the 7800X 3D has both a lower TJ Maxx to protect the sensitive V-cache and also a lower frequency ceiling to protect the 7950X3D from getting cannibalized too hard. 75 is relatively low for this generation and illustrates that we're hitting other caps prior to the thermal limiter, which although lower is still higher than 75. The 7700X, however, did boost to TJ Maxx. That's how it's designed. With the same cooler, it pulled more power and pushed frequency higher, as you saw earlier, until it hit about 92 degrees Celsius average all core. Moving on to the main points then. So the 7800X3D is extremely efficient. This follows on the same path AMD was setting with its other X3D CPUs, not necessarily with the initial 7000 launch, but they got there with Eco mode. So it is very efficient in at least all core workloads. That's a good thing. For gaming, we did see uplift and it was meaningful when the 3DV cache works and it doesn't work in every game. We've talked about this a lot already, not gonna cover when and why it works, but when it works, it is actually good and uh, it does make the CPU strongly worth considering. We'll go over more of that in a second. This is a total waste in production first use cases. So if you are not gaming as a primary use for your computer, you should buy something else. It's really as simple as a 7950X or 13900K, 13700K, 13th gen, seriously worth considering for something like a desktop class computer you use for Adobe software, compiling, uh, compression, decompression, maybe, but AMD is more competitive there, especially in decompression. Either way, this CPU does not make sense for those use cases because you're spending the money on something that those applications can't use. You could spend that same money on a more powerful CPU for those applications. But for gaming, it's worth talking about. Uh, and then the last major point before we get to the details is this, as we said earlier, makes the 7900X3D look absolutely terrible as 
any kind of value for gaming. And it's, it's for easy reasons. We already explained them. So this, basically pretend that the 79X 3D doesn't exist. This invalidates it. And we had a feeling it was going that direction when we reviewed the 79X 3D a month or whatever ago it was. It's been a long time now uh, that, that those CPUs have been out and this one was in the wings. So going over the details, uh, the reason it looks terrible is because it's getting beaten in scenarios where the eight cores on this are better than the effective six cores on the 79 when you're parking the cores. Uh, all you're giving up there is between the two CPUs is maybe a workstation advantage definitely in the 79X 3D but uh, for other reasons already mentioned, it's relevant. Secondly, uh, the 7800X 3D for gaming, occasionally the 7700X beats it, but that's when frequency matters more than the additional cache. We showed a chart earlier demonstrating it, but the frequency is higher on the 7700X in our testing for an all-core workload, and that benefits it in games where that's what they care about. Really rapidly recapping the charts then, the biggest competitors are the 13.7 and the 13.6, uh, in CSGO, they make more sense, but that class for performance, 13700K at the same price, roughly or cheaper, is better, assuming no other options exist than the 7800X 3D. In Cyberpunk, the 13700K and 7800X 3D were tied with the advantage to the 13700K for lows. In F1, there was a massive performance boost for X3D, as we've seen before, and a big gain versus the 13700K. Far Cry 6, 78X 3D was a clear leader. Final Fantasy XIV, the 13700K was a clear leader. So they're going back and forth here. In Shadow of the Tomb Raider, the 78X 3D was a clear leader. It's not even close. And in Total War, Warhammer, it was about tied. So where that leaves us then is, uh, I suppose, analyzing how large is the gap when there is a gap between the CPU and to whom does the favor go. For the most part, when there's a gap, it largely benefits the 7800X 3D. However, when the 7800X 3D is not leading, the 13700K's lead, other than in Final Fantasy, it's maybe less impressive. But overall, they do go back and forth a bit. The 13700K, to us, uh, maybe makes more sense as an all-around CPU, being a little bit cheaper and uh, also having advantages in production workloads. If you are only gaming, then the 7800X 3D suddenly becomes much more worth considering. But unfortunately, there's no easy answer for uh, unless you play one of the games that a reviewer is testing, how much does it help you personally? Because it is very game to game. It's not as clear cut. The 7800X 3D is much better value than the 7900X 3D. The 79 now looks like a complete and utter joke. The 7950X 3D has more or less been uh, entirely invalidated, more so maybe than previously. Previously it had that sort of, but it's technically the best that it could hold on to, but now it's not even really, uh, <laughs> it's not enough. So uh, from our perspective, you're either looking at a 78X 3D from AMD for the top end gaming CPU, just ignore the others. They're not worth the money and sometimes they're worse uh, or the 13700K for the same price. Those are the two to narrow it down a lot. And the 13.6 remains amazing value if you want to get basically top end CPU performance for $300 to save money for your GPU or RAM or something. So that's it for this one. Thanks for watching as always. Let us know what you thought of the additional depth on the frame times. If you want us to spend review airtime on that in the future, we can add more of them or do more interesting analysis if people really like it. Uh, it's something we did a long time ago, but we moved away from it because it just can't fit as much stuff on the charts and uh, it requires every time a little bit more audience education because anytime you get new people in who haven't seen them before, we need to explain it, which is totally cool and I love doing it but it does mean you get an extra 20 second explainer every time. Okay, that's it for this one. Thanks for watching. As always, subscribe for more. Go to store.gamersnexus.net to grab one of our brand new project and solder mats, which are awesome for things uh, all the way from model building and miniatures up to component repair, soldering, highly heat resistant stuff. Check it out on the store. Thanks for watching. Subscribe for more. We'll see you all next time.